All right, and we're in uh, Luke chapter one, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at the statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do, you not, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And, and behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, a bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Well, after John's, after John the Baptist's mother became pregnant with John, that's what the word, that's what the phrase, in the sixth month. In, in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel came from the presence of God to a city in Nazareth, in, in Galilee called Nazareth. And the angel greets her, uh, greetings, favored one. But by the way, notice how particular Luke is in locating this story. It's a particular region, Galilee, uh, a, a particular town, Nazareth, a particular man and woman. This is not myth or legend. This is history. And the angel said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. That word favored, carito means some one who is endued with honor or grace. It's derived from charis, which is the New Testament word for benefit, gift, or grace. And this doesn't mean, as some falsely teach, that Mary is a dispenser of grace. Rather, she's the recipient of God's grace. And the Lord is with you underscores God's enablement of Mary. God is gifting Mary with grace so that she will be able to accomplish his purpose. And Mary, it says, was perplexed. I mean, a, a, a stronger translation would be she's disturbed. She's greatly troubled. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, an angel is standing in front of her. People don't see angels or, uh, normally ever. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Again, the angel speaks of Mary's favor, her charis with God. Charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, is the root for the words free gift. In Romans chapter 6, the free gift, the charisma of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, why is Mary gifted with such grace? Is there something God wants to do in her or through her? Yes, and the angel tells her what it is. And behold, you will conceive, oh, hey, Mary, uh, Rosemary, God bless, good morning. I'm looking at my notes here. I didn't. So, so what is it that she's got? Why is she being gifted with such charis? because there's something God wants to do in her life. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. That's a lot of revelation for, for just a, a, a momentary encounter. Notice four important revelations. <clears throat> First of all, Mary, though she's unwed, will conceive a child, this would be a unique birth. Secondly, the child would be named Jesus, the Greek form of a Hebrew name, Yeshua, which means God saves. Joseph had been given very specific, the same specific directions by the angel. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his, name, his people from their sins. A third revelation, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high, the son of El Elyon. And surely he will be great because he'll be God's son, the glory of God incarnate in human flesh. 
And fourthly, he'll not only be descended from David legally through Joseph and genetically through Mary, but he will reestablish the throne, the kingdom of David, and will reign over that kingdom forever. And this implies the eternality of her child. <laughs> she can have a child. I mean, look at all that revelation. She can have a child not conceived by her uh, or conceived in her, but not through a human father. This child will be the savior of his nation. He'll reign over the throne of David. He'll be the son of the most high and he's eternal. That's a lot of revelation. It's way beyond anybody's capacity to understand. And, but listen to Mary's humble response. How can this be since I know not a man, since I'm a virgin? She's not expressing unbelief. Rather, it's incredulity, perplexity. Her expectation is normal. I'll be married to Joseph and I'll have children through Joseph. How could she have a child any other way? She didn't have a Bible with a Christmas story. And the angel replies, well, here's how. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. The same Holy Spirit, uh, who, and she knew the story of creation. At creation, the Holy Spirit hovered over the unformed, dark expanse of the deep. Who, with God the Father and God the Son, shared in the creation of light and life. This same Spirit will come upon Mary with the creative power of El Elyon the Most High. El Elyon depicts the God who is almighty in creating and upholding that which he creates. El Elyon will overshadow Mary. <clears throat> that word could also be translated encompass. The, the power of El Elyon will encompass you, overshadow you. The word overshadow is the same word or encompass is the same word used in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, and a bright cloud overshadowed them or encompassed them. That was the Shekinah glory of God encompassing them on the mountain. So the glory of God encompassed Mary, the Shekinah glory of God encompassed Mary with creative life generating power, conceiving in her the life of Jesus. And for that reason, the angel adds, for that reason, the holy child shall be called the son of God. Well, to further build Mary's confidence, I mean, you would want to have your confidence built up right now. And the messenger reminds her that her relative Elizabeth, who was called barren, is now pregnant in her old age. And then he testifies, for nothing will be impossible with God. That verse can be translated for no word of God, no rhema of God, not, lo, not no logos, but no rhema of God is empty of power. He says, let me build your confidence, Mary. Elizabeth, who is barren, is now pregnant in her old age. For no rhema of God is empty of power. Every word that God speaks contains in it the power necessary to call into being the reality of that word. Just as an acorn contains the building blocks of an oak tree, just as human DNA contains the information needed to build a human being, so the word of God carries in it the life and power needed to bring about that word, to bring that word into fulfillment. Now, certainly Elizabeth had limitations. She was advanced in age and barren, and yet God, God gave her a son, John, forerunner of the Messiah. Mary had a limitation. She had no husband. And yet God purposed to conceive in her his son, and nothing is impossible with God. No word of God, no word of God is without the power to bring forth that which is contained in the word. So Mary, Mary now confesses her faithful surrender to God's purpose. Behold, a bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. She doesn't say that she understands. She just submits, and the angel departed from her. Notice the emphasis on Mary's virginity here. We cannot understand the life and ministry of Jesus unless we understand this fundamental truth. Jesus was conceived by God, not man. Only in this way could he be God in human form and accomplish the work which God purposed from eternity and the work that God had promised through the prophets, beginning in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it was promised that a redeemer would be born of the seed of a woman. 
before Adam and Eve were evicted from the garden, God revealed that somebody born of the seed of the woman will someday bruise the head of the serpent, though he would be bruised on the head on the heel. It's not biologically correct to speak of the seed of a woman, but this would be a special birth not involving the seed of man. This uniquely conceived man will crush the head of the serpent. That's a mortal wound, though he would be bruised on the heel. That is, he would be wounded. Now, we interpret that passage from our perspective. We see Jesus conceived without the seed of a man who, though he was beaten and crucified, broke the power of Satan. That was promised in Genesis chapter 3 before Adam and Eve even left the garden. Now, it was necessary that the Redeemer would be born of a woman so that he could share the same human nature as those whom he came to save. It was equally necessary they'd be perfectly God because only God can offer a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And thus Jesus, pre-existent, second person of the Trinity, was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin, son of man, son of God, perfectly human, perfectly divine, two natures, one person. Now, it was also prophesied that the woman would be a virgin. Uh, the Lord gave this revelation hundreds of years before this through Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. In that context, God was calling the Israelite king, Ahaz, to trust him during a time of adversity and to bolster the king's faith. The Lord at, said, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. So, I know these are tough times, Ahaz. Ask for a sign and I'll give you a sign. And the king replied self-righteously, and this is in Isaiah chapter 7. The king replied very self-righteously, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord, which is silly when God says, let me give you a sign. That's just self-righteous. God pr responded pr by providing a sign that would not come into being for 700 years. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, there are people who argue against the virgin birth of Jesus by reminding us that the Hebrew word Alma could be translated maiden, which would read a maiden will be with child. But how would that be a sign from God? Young women, maidens have babies every day. God wouldn't say, uh, here's a sign for you, King Ahaz. A young lady will have a baby. <laughs> That's not a sign. <laughs> the word Alma is usually translated virgin because young maidens in that culture were virgins. Alma must mean virgin in this context, or it makes no sense that God would use this as a sign. God would not say, behold, a maiden will bear a son. That's not a sign. It's normal. It's an everyday occurrence. The, the, fact, the fact that the prophecy was not fulfilled in, in Isaiah's day doesn't discredit the prophecy. Many Bible prophecies are given centuries in advance of their fulfillment. So that Jesus was born of a virgin is the testimony of Luke and Matthew in fulfillment of God's promise through Isaiah. For instance, and we, we've already read this, uh, but, but let's, Matthew, uh, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, testifies that Joseph and Mary, though engaged, had not yet come together in intimate communion. Uh, we, we hadn't read this yet in, in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord then testified, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Matthew then writes in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and, bear a, and shall bear a son. Because Matthew is quoting from a Greek translation of Isaiah chapter 7, he used the word parthenos, which is the Greek word for an unmarried daughter who has not had sexual relations, a virgin. Luke, writing in Greek, testifies that the angel... Gabriel came to a virgin, and the virgin's name was Mary. Luke also uses the word parthenot, parthenos, which is, we said, normally translated virgin. The angel tells her that though she is without a husband, she will conceive and bear a son. And Mary naturally asks, uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, we read this, how can this be since I know not a man, I don't have a husband? 
literally Mary said, how can this be since I don't know a man? She's testifying of her, of her virginity. And the angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child should be called the Son of God. In other words, you will conceive even without a husband because God, the Holy Spirit, will conceive life in you. The clear testimony of Scripture is that the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in Mary's womb. It's equally clear that the life which was conceived in Mary was the life of God. This is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. If you want to turn to it, turn to Colossians, turn right to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Not Galatians, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> After Acts and Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians, and then uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, let, let me know when you're there. Colossians. This is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. Bible. Uh, we can quote it. We can teach from it. It's very, uh, well, it's impossible to truly understand the mystery of it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. You ready? For in him, referring to Jesus, for in him, all the fullness of deity or all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. What a revelation. The fullness of God in bodily form. Jesus Christ is the express image of God, the character, the essence, the substance, the fullness of God revealed in human form. What a mark, the fullness of deity in bodily form. Now turn right a few pages to Hebrews chapter 1. Past 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to Hebrews chapter 1. Well, I'm sorry, I meant Paul's letters. Letters to Timothy and Titus. And then Hebrews chapter, and Philemon. And then Hebrews chapter 1. A marvelous Marvelous revelation of who, who is this that was born in human form? Who is it we're celebrating at Christmas? Hebrews chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance or brightness of his glory and the exact representation or image of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power when he had made purification of sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high now notice he said he said he is the representation or image of god's nature that word representation or image is c h a r a k t e r character from which we derive the English word character. The Greek word character refers to an engraving or a figure stamped on a coin, a, a coin, an, an exact image of something. Just as a coin bears the stamp or impress of something, so Jesus bore the exact stamp of God's being. And also it says that he, uh, he's the, the radiance or the brightness of his glory, the exact represent, the exact image or representation of his nature. That word nature is hypostasis and can be translated essence, persons, person, substance. Hypostasis is the essence of something. What God essentially is was made manifest, visible in Jesus. He's the image of God's substance. What is the, the image of God's substance? So uh, reading again, this uh, just expanding on this Hebrews chapter one, Jesus was the shining revelation of God's glory. He was the, the substance of God's being. He was the image of God's character. So the shining revelation of God's glory, every time Jesus taught the truth, every time he healed a lame man, or gave sight to the blind. Every time he forgave sin, raised the dead, pronounced woe upon his persecutors, God was revealing glory, his glory. 
whereas the radiance of his glory refers to the outer manifestation of the life of the Father in Jesus. The, the very image of his substance refers to the inner essence of the Father in Jesus. Jesus was and ever shall be God in substance. He's God in essence, God in nature. He's the fullness of God, the fullness of deity in bodily form. In a manner unexplained, but merely stated as fact and truth, the angel says to Mary that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her and cause her to conceive. God himself, the sovereign creator of the universe, overshadowed Mary's womb with creative power and glory. And because of this divine creative miracle, the angel declared the holy offspring shall be called the son of God. God conceived the life of God in Mary's womb. Jesus, the uncreated second person of the Trinity, eternal son of God, self-existent, uncreated, existing in glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit from eternity, was conceived in the womb of Mary, born into time. He was the glory of God in a body, the embodiment of the Shekinah. Now, my, my question always when I read these scriptures, how, I, I, how could you do that? How could the creator of the universe fit himself into creaturehood? I, I think about that. The, how could the creator of the universe, which he transcends the universe, and there may be multiple universes. It may be infinite. And he transcends that. He fit himself into creaturehood. How could the eternal God fit himself into time? See, well, we get a little bit of a sense of that. We turn left to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, the book, right? The letter right before uh, Colossians. So turn back through the epistles to Timothy and Titus and Philemon, back through Thessalonians 1 and 2, back through Colossians and then to Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, beginning with verse 5, Paul gives this marvelous revelation of, of the incarnation. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul says, the Son of God existed in the form of God. We understand that. He's pre-existent, eternal, self-existent, uh, uncreated being. Uh, all things were created by him and for him and through him. He existed in the form of God, but did not consider equality with God a thing to be held on to or grasped. Rather, he veiled the glory of God so he could take the form of a servant. The word form, he's in the form of God. He was in the form of God, took the form of a servant. In both cases, that word form is the Greek word morphe, M-O-R-P-H-E. Now, there are two Greek words that can be translated into the English word form, schema and morphe. In English, we just say form. In, in Greek, it depends on what you're talking about. What, morphe refers to the inner unchanging substance of a person's being. You are a human being in your morphe. And that will never be altered. Schema refers to the outward form or appearance. And that may change from time to time. Your outward appearance, your schema, has changed from the appearance of a baby to a child to a, a young adult, adult, and so on. And in your schema will continue to change throughout your life. But your morphe, your humanness, will never change. You will never cease to be human. From eternity, Jesus existed in the form, the morphe of God, possessing the true essence and unchanging nature of God. He was in the beginning with God. He is and was and always will be God. He's co-equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. They share the same essence of being. Jesus did not cease to be God 
but entered into another manner of, of existence who, though he was in the morphe, the form of God, took on the morphe, the form of a bond servant being made in the likeness of a human being. That word likeness is homoima, which refers to the true essence of something. He was, he was in the form of God, though he existed in the form, he all, it took the form of a bond servant being made in the homoima, the likeness of a human being. And Paul goes on to say that Jesus was found in appearance as a man. That word appearance is schema. I mean, we, just meant, we just said that schema is the outward condition. Jesus was born in the morphe of God, in the homoima, the likeness of a man, but his schema, his appearance was the same as any man. If you had looked at him, you would not have seen uh, the morphe of God, though he manifested the morphe. You, you, what you, you have seen was a man, looked like a man, dressed like a man, ate like a man. Uh, how, so how could the creator take on the form of a creature? How could the eternal God enter and live in time? How could the God who is infinite take on human limitations? How could Jesus be perfectly God and perfectly man the fullness of deity in bodily form. This is a holy mystery. But as a matter of faith, we confess that Jesus continued to be truly God while also becoming truly man, continued to be the creator of all, yet existing as a creature. He continued to be the everlasting, eternal, infinite God while entering the limitations of time and space. Jesus became perfectly human without diminishing or relinquishing any aspect of his deity. He remained perfectly God while becoming perfect man. Son of God became son of Mary. And Paul tells us that Jesus did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, there's a twofold sense to this. He didn't grasp at equality with God as Satan had tried to do because that was his possession. He didn't need to grasp at who he is. And secondly, he did not hold on to equality with God so as to deny humanity a redeemer. So then what does Paul mean when he says that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men? Of what did he empty himself? Well, it surely cannot mean that he surrendered any of the qualities or attributes or essence of deity because God cannot become less than God. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I, for I, the Lord, do not change. That's called the doctrine of divine immutability. God cannot be diminished or extended. God cannot cease to be God. God is perfectly, eternally, infinitely God. And if you're perfectly, eternally, and infinite, if you're perfect, eternally, and infinite, you cannot cease to be that or be other than that. So Jesus did not empty himself of his deity. He was the, de he was the fullness of deity, but born in bodily form, incarnate in bodily form. So what does he mean he emptied himself? Well, he emptied himself of some of the rights and privileges of deity. He left the riches of heaven to share the poverty of people. He was born into a humble home and lived with humble people. If you saw that Christmas uh, uh, of, the, of Chosen, the Christmas film of, of the Chosen series, he was literally born in a in a some kind of barn or stable uh and and, and in the film Jesus, uh, joseph is sweeping manure out of the way uh and, and their hands are somewhat uh, dirty their robes are he was born into that he left the and by the way a, a cool revelation that, that when it says that there was no room for them in the inn that's not the normal word for inn it's the word for a temporary shelter. Evidently, the overflow of the inn was so much that they built a temporary shelter for the overflow, and there was no room in the overflow shelter for the Son of God born in human form. So he left the riches of heaven to be born in a, in a barn. He was born into a humble home, lived with humble people. The creator of trees worked with wood in a carpenter shop. The creator of water became thirsty. He was subject to human infirmities. He became weary. He was subject to temptation. He was worthy of worship, but submitted to ridicule, rejection, abuse. So he emptied himself of some of the rights or privileges of deity. Also, he emptied himself means that he didn't 
he didn't give up his glory. God cannot cease to be glorious, but uh, he, he must have veiled his glory. Uh, we just read in Hebrews chapter one that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He didn't divest himself of the glory of God. God cannot cease to be glorious, but he certainly shielded or veiled his glory because how could people have looked upon him in the fullness of his God likeness? On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John beheld the unveiling glory of Jesus. He wasn't just showing them his future glory. He was showing them the glory that had always been his. But he couldn't have existed in the womb of Mary. He couldn't have grown as a child in a common Jewish home or preached the gospel and called people to repentance if the fullness of Shekinah glory had emanated from him. So he shielded his glory. And he emptied himself in the sense that he voluntarily limited the exercise of his attributes. He didn't relinquish his attributes. He limited or restricted their exercise in order to identify with humanity. For instance, when he ministered among the people, uh, he wasn't, God is omnipresent, but Jesus had to travel by foot or by boat or by donkey. There was one occasion in John chapter six where a boat arrived immediately at shore, but Typically, Jesus was only present in one place at one time, the omnipresent God. It doesn't appear that Jesus healed people because he was the son of God, but because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to heal. In Luke chapter 5, verse 17, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Doesn't appear that he normally exercised omniscience but rather he received wisdom and knowledge from his father, John chapter 12 and John chapter eight and chapter 15. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. It appears that Jesus was dependent on the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the performance of his ministry. In that sense, though he's perfectly God, he emptied himself of the independent exercise of divine attributes in humble submission to the Father. He didn't cease to be God, but rather God became a servant. Now there's a mystery there because Jesus said, I and the Father, I and the Father are one. But he also said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And he said, truly, in John chapter five, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the father doing for whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. He was submitted, he humbled himself to the father. And in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, yet not my will, but yours be done. He's co-equal with the father. And yet he's, he's submitted uh, to the father in, in humble obedience. That speaks of his self empty, the giving up, of, this, of certain privileges, privileges of deity and humble submission to the Father. So the incarnation of God in human form is at its heart, it's a mystery, isn't it? Two natures, human and divine, united in one person. The mighty creator through whom, by whom, for whom all things were created became a creature. The ancient of days who existed from eternity born into time, son of God, son of Mary. The fullness of deity expressed in bodily form. The ancient creeds of the church do not attempt to explain this, but do confess it as truth. I want to read from the Nicene Creed formulated in 325 AD, <clears throat> when the bishops of the church met together to formulate doctrine in creedal statements because of all the false teachers. But Satan only has two ways to try to destroy the church persecution from the outside and false teaching from the inside. And so the Nicene Creed, a creed is an expression of truth. It's like a picture frame. Inside the frame is the picture, outside is not the picture. So just quoting from parts of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
For our sake, he was crucified. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose, from, he rose again. Well, I have one last question. This is a mystery to me, but I have another question about this mystery. Why did God do this? What motivated the creator of the universe to leave the riches and gl glory of heaven? What, made it, what motivated the eternal God to fit himself into time and creaturehood? What, <clears throat> what motivated the perfect, sinless, just one to take the sin of the world and his own justice upon himself? What, made it the, what motivated the source of all life to take our death upon himself? Or in other words, what's the reason for Christmas? The Apostle Paul answers this question in his first epistle to Timothy, Timothy chapter one, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that, Jesus, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. The reason for the incarnation, the reason for Christmas is simply this. The lostness of humanity and our helplessness to save ourselves called forth the mercy of God. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What's the reason for this for the season? The lostness of humanity. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Such is the kindness and the mercy of God. Well, are there any questions or comments? Oh, I want to read the lyrics to Old Little Town of Bethlehem. Old Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. O oh, morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. How precious that is. And I love how Charles Wesley said uh, in, in uh, verse 2 of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. What a wonderful story. What a wonderful story. Creator of the universe entered human form to redeem us. My Lord. Any questions or comments? That's so rich and insightful. <laughs> All the you know meanings of the words and whatnot. That was just really awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to add that I agree. And there's just so much depth there that I know in my own life, I can easily overlook and it's right there. You know, it's just, it, I, I don't even have words. Um, Mark and I got to go and worship the other evening in the park and um, I battled with, you know, just this thing of being seen. I don't want to be seen. And, but the Lord said worship. And um, my heart was so tenderized to just 
trying to express that love yeah. to the point I was down on my knees and I just don't have any words. It's just so beautiful. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. I think sometimes the hymn writers, the painters, the filmmakers, the dancers, the artisan expresses it better than, than the words of a teacher because it's so unfathomable. What a, what a marvelous miracle. Yeah, I will say that the, the artisan needs the words of the teacher. Yeah. So yeah. we know what we're, what we're experiencing and, and what we're to try to yeah. <laughs> try to show, yeah. try to display. Yeah, I agree. That, by the way, is one of the miracles of the 18th century. Uh, several hundred thousand, maybe more. English people were streaming into the kingdom of God through what we call the evangelical revival in England. But most of them could not read or write. Well, how do you disciple people who can't read or write? Well, God had already settled that. He raised up Charles, John Wesley was the great evangelist. Charles Wesley was the great hymn writer. He wrote 5,000 hymns. And, and they would put the hymns to the folk tunes of the day. And, and people already knew the tunes. And if you learned maybe just 20 of these songs, you'd have a good sense of doctrine. And for instance, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Well, there you go. There, what a, he said that better than, than anybody could have said it. So anyway, uh, anything else? There's just so much hope in the season. There's so much hope, so yes. much hope. Yes. It just covers everything, it covers everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else? I was just trying to figure out how to put this all into words. Um, after listening to you, I, I'm, I'm glad you, um, went over this and reminded us or reminded me of, even though I've heard the story of Mary and, and how she come to conceive and, and um, but to finish it with Timothy and the reason why Jesus is here. And it just makes me feel like I need to do more with witnessing. Yeah, yes. You know, that's one of my prayers for next year. I need to be more fruitful in my witness. I want to be more fruitful in my witness. We should all, we, we pray that today. Lord, help us all to be more fruitful next year in witnessing. <clears throat> Is there anything else? <clears throat> well, why don't we celebrate together uh, Holy Communion Father, we're so amazed and grateful and filled with wonder that you would conceive in the womb of Mary, the second person of the Trinity, because we were lost and our lostness aroused in you mercy and grace. We're amazed that before Adam and Eve were evicted from the garden, you promised a redeemer, a deliverer. You made covenant with Abraham to establish a people, a covenant nation. And you made promises to that nation that someday the redeemer would be born in their midst. And so it was. And we praise you, Jesus, for the humility and the unfathomable love that caused you to let go of the riches of heaven to be born in human form in a stable. We, we're speechless when we consider the love that caused you to go to the cross and take upon yourself, you the sinless one, taking our sin. 
you the giver of life, bearing our death because of your great love for us. We celebrate your resurrection from the dead and we surely celebrate the offer of redeeming grace, which is available now, which we have tasted and which is available for every person in the world. And we join together in this celebration of that Passover, that last Passover that you celebrated with your disciples. And we remember how you took the bread and you blessed it. And you said, this is my body given for you. And so we bless this bread and we ask you would consecrate it to be for us more than just a memory or a memorial, but a present experience of your life. We remember how you took the cup and you blessed it and you said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so we bless this cup. We ask that you would consecrate it to be for us the reality of your presence, your redeeming grace. We ask you to consecrate us to receive these elements in faith. And we celebrate that only a few hours after you took this bread and this cup in your hands and blessed it, you inaugurated a new covenant whereby we might rise from death into life, from the slavery to sin and death to new life, everlasting life, and new creaturehood in you. We join with all the church in proclaiming Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We remember all that you did. We look forward to that day when you will descend with the host of heaven and establish on this earth justice and peace and all tyranny and all sin will be broken and the earth will be restored and we will give you thanks and praise and blessing and honor as you rule from your throne in Jerusalem. We look forward to that day, but we greet you this day. We greet you this happy morning. And so we take this bread in our hands, O oh God, remembering how you said, this is my body broken, given for you, take and eat. Remembering how you took the cup and blessed it, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant given for you and for many take and drink. We take and drink. And we've celebrated you today, O oh Lord. We ask you would send us forth now to show our love for you through joyful obedience. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well,